There's not a single thing that technology can't do that the human consciousness cannot. People don't even take the first step because they're so afraid that if they take the risk, if they actually move towards the things that are connected with their heart and their purpose, that somehow everything's going to collapse. All right, hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Awoke Podcast. Today we have my good friend, Madison. Madison is one of my best friends from Playa del Carmen, Mexico, and he has a lot of different interesting insights onto spiritual healing, spiritual growth, and everything in between. So Madison, thanks for being here. Absolutely, thank and, you. And uh, would you like to tell him a little about yourself and uh, what your mission is? Sure, so yeah, um, I live in Playa del Carmen, where we both are right now, Mexico, in the Yucatan Peninsula, and here I work as a spiritual guide, and I work with a lot of business executives, entrepreneurs, and I help them on their spiritual path. And a lot of it has to do with healing, old traumas, figuring out their purpose, where they want to go in life, um, becoming the kind of energy and person they want to attract. And I help them with that. And what Albert and I also share is we both met each other about a year ago. Uh, we started a, a men's circle, actually, in Plaid the Carmen, uh, helping men develop their masculinity, uh, tapping into that masculine energy, and um, just helping them through whatever daily life problems they, they're going through. Yeah, so we, we kind of crossed paths in a way where it was just like perfect timing. I was looking to start a men's group, um, just finding like-minded men in, in the area here in Mexico. Um, I was coming from the U.S. this time uh, or that time that we met where there was just a lot of different, I, I felt like there was a lack of having that connection with guys beyond just this the status game, really just dissecting and going deeper into the sense of brotherhood, into the sense of um, helping one another become the best version of ourselves. And so Madison and I, when we crossed paths, we both kind of in that similar position and we decided, yeah, you know what, let's go ahead and start a, a group here. We're going to start um, having people come and express how they're... Uh, it was actually an amazing, sorry to cut you off, but it was an amazing story how we met. Uh, Plaid the Carmen, where we, where we are now and where I live in Mexico, is this incredibly... Uh, incredible vortex place where there's all these synchronicities and the way Albert and I met actually is we met at this really popular salad bar and it was incredibly busy and um, I, I, uh, I think what it was was that uh, you I was sitting down and there was only one space available in the whole restaurant and Albert said hey could I could I sit here and you know it's very courageously and I said okay, okay. <laughs> and uh, he starts talking what do you do what do I do and he's like oh yeah I'm you know I'm working and coaching oh me too uh, spirituality yeah me too and then uh, he brought up the, he wants to do a men's circle. And I was like, oh, that's exactly what I want to do too. So it's just, the place we live is this amazing place where lots of um, people with similar ideas, they, they get put in the right place in the right time together to, to work on these things, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah, it was, it was just very synchronized that we just kind of met and uh, had similar paths. But uh, I wanted to ask you just so you, you know, I, I obviously know this, but if you can explain to everybody mm -hmm. why you decided to, to move to Mexico uh, you're originally from California, mm. um, and you, you were born and raised there, and you decided at one point that you're no longer going to be living in the U.S. So yeah. what brought you here, and why did you decide to become a, a digital nomad? Yeah, yeah. Um, it was completely nothing that I had seen coming early on in life. Uh, I remember my uncle, uh, when I was a kid, he asked me, you know, he's a big traveler, do you, want to, uh, do you want to go see the world? Do you want to go out, you know, what countries do you want to see? And I said, uh, I don't. I just want to be in California. My path was to work in technology in San Francisco, where I grew up, and that was it. And I just said, no, that's where I want to be. Uh, but life had a different turn of events. I ended up just, um, for a lot of my university years, actually studying abroad. And I studied abroad in the United Kingdom, and I studied abroad in Jerusalem, in Israel. And so I kind of got used to um, this life of being away. And so much to the point that I started to um, kind of fall in touch, out of touch with a lot of things that were happening in the U.S. And I just liked learning about other cultures and societies and it's what I studied in university. I majored in anthropology and I just loved studying cultures and communities and I think language is also interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, I, you know, I've been traveling around the world for the last five years, um, something like 25 countries. I've lived in maybe eight of those for, you know, months, you know, a few months on and off. And, um, but the whole time I was really on this, uh, I would call it my, my own spiritual journey which was to, in a large part, uh, to find myself. Uh, and I had this kind of medical problem that I was trying to figure out. Uh, but, you know, wherever I, I went, you know, there I was, and I still had the problem. 
And you know, I was a lot of time. You know, I was trying to find out where did I fit in, where where did I belong. And it wasn't until uh, yeah, COVID happened that it kind of forced me to leave California. I took a one-way flight to uh, Croatia uh, as soon as um, I heard the news. And uh, within three months, I loved it there. Met these amazing guys, and they had just been in Mexico. And you know, the Croatia it closed down, and they said, "Hey, let's go to Mexico." And I thought, like, "Oh no, I don't want to go to Mexico." And, I grew up in a place like California. We're both from the West Coast, U.S. There's, in my opinion, a lot of uh, kind of propaganda, like racism, really not nice things that are said about this country. And you know, I kind of had that programming, and I said, oh, you know, Mexico. Why would I want to go there? But when I came to Plaza Carmen, uh, it's just there's this immediate sense of home and community, and I just fell in love with it. And I've been here for a year and a half, and you have the four-year residency, so I. Uh, I'm almost Mexican. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You took the next step, so yeah, yeah. now you're you're a resident here, and you plan to stay here long term. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I'm yeah. Uh, even planning to build a community here. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, going back to the topic of just brotherhood of masculinity, mm. um, that's one thing that we we connected on really really since we became friends. So, I wanted to to really ask you what sort of what sort of things do you think the modern world in terms of connection with um, with having that brotherhood, having that tribe, where do you think we have such a separation now where it's kind of this free-for-all, this status game, this idea of um, wanting to just win everybody over rather than being a collaborative space? What, what sort of, what sort of do you think, believe, or what do you believe actually caused this? And what is the, what is the ultimate solution in your eyes? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, 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 a, you know, it's, it's a long question. I think there's many factors at play. Um, I think, uh, you know, well, we're both in the U.S., it's this very, um, the whole culture in itself is individualistic, right? It's all about, uh, you know, whereas maybe countries in Europe, they're a bit more collectivist, they think about the group, the society, but we're from the U.S., it's very much, um, you know, there's me, there's other people, we're here to compete. Um, a lot of the work I do is, you know, uh, in spirituality, it's about, you know, looking at the ego, and the idea is when you break down ego, you start to see, you know, we get away from this I, 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 this me, 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 what's for, for me, the selfishness, the self absorbedness all this narcissism. And when we start to let that go, we start to drop more into our hearts, you know, less in our mind, the narcissism, the me, 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 the hearts. And, uh, and, you know, we start to be more compassionate about other people and care about other men. And so I think that it's largely a, um, to think about a more spiritual level, I think it's, it's an ego problem. And it's, you know, our society is, um, you know, under this illusion that we're all, we're all separate as beings and that, you know, we're, we're not this collective that really matters. And that somehow by me beating everyone else out, you know, up, uh, whether it's uh, to business or sports or whatever, that we're somehow um, better than others, but it's an illusion. And so I think when we can let go of the pride, the, the selfishness, uh, the self-absorbedness, we start to actually care for other people. But we also, what I think is more important, which most people don't quite agree with, I think where we're from is you actually get better results. And you mm -hmm. start to, you know, see other men not as competitors, whether it's for mates or business, but as people to work with, to collaborate. Yeah. You can actually work much, much smarter and more efficiently and I think more joyfully, which matters too in the end. Yeah. Yeah. Before my spiritual growth, there was definitely a point where I was trying to understand why is it that all my my idea of brotherhood, my idea of having a tribe was all about who is here to benefit me, who's going to be at the club with me, making me look good, mm. um, passing around the bottle, you know, making sure that I look like I have high status, so on and so forth. And so that was my idea of brotherhood before I really started dissecting it. And when I really went down, down the rabbit hole of spirituality and really understanding what building a tribe really means, it's more so about actually creating a community where you build one another based on a reflection of each other. You kind of mirror each other. You start seeing that, you know, say your, your vibration is low and my vibration is high. I, I am able to reflect what you're experiencing and help uplift you in the same way that if I have the opposite effect where my vibe is low and your vibe is high, we kind of we kind of bring each other up, sharpen each other's swords, so to say. I mean, there's there's a reason why the spiritual text says these sort of things. And so I think that's what it's really about is to, to really create that sort of community of sharpening one another's swords and really being able to not 
tackle and attack the world in a combat way, but ultimately understand what the warrior within is to be able to understand the that all this all this anger and all these masculine emotions that you feel there is other people like you experiencing these things and if you can come together to collaborate instead of compete that's where a lot of the healing and a lot of the growth happens would you agree with that yeah absolutely um yeah i mean i guess uh kind of tagging what you were on to for me it was a it was a big transition like um my whole kind of university years were um, in these, you know, I went to these very Ivy League level schools in the UK, I went to Royal University, you know, I'm with um, people where it's largely what you're saying. It's been, you know, at that time of my life, it was the, the name of the game was status, money, your job title. That was what more people were more interested in. All my friends went to Ivy League schools or equivalents. And, you know, at one point I had this experience where I asked my best friend at the time, like, um, why, um, why are we friends? He's like, well, uh, you know, you went to so and so school, uh, you had this prestigious fellowship, but it had nothing to do with the quality of my personal character. And I just thought, well, that can't be what friendship is. That right. can't really be what brotherhood is. Uh, what I think is a beautiful thing about, you know, lessons learned, you know, uh, we're both traveling a lot. Um, you know, there's a lot of things to learn from that. But one of the great things to experience and learn in a place like Plaza de Carmen, um, again, in Mexico, is that in my opinion, a lot of my friends here are incredibly successful. Um, authors, uh, YouTubers, um, incredible entrepreneurs, coaches. But, you know, when people ask you, you know, uh, who are you or what are you doing? They don't want to know, you know, what is your job title or, you know, are you useful to me or not? It's just simply a matter of knowing about the person. Right. And when you hear people, you know, we dress a bit more, well, it's hot, but we, you know, we dress a bit more casually. Um, you know, it's, you probably want to be in suits, but... Um, I think it allows uh, the community and the atmosphere and the people that this place attracts allows us to more easily develop that kind of community. Yeah, yeah. I th I think just my opinion why I'll, Madison works with a lot of high level entrepreneurs and people who have gone through the corporate world, who have gone through uh, a lot of trials and errors, and really just made tons of money and created incredible lives. But there's always this destination syndrome where they never quite reach that fulfillment and that satisfaction and that only comes with genuinely going within and looking within um, and being able to heal all of, all the energy blocks all of the um, deeper shadow work and people just people believe that you can just go non-stop you can just keep going and going and going but there's no there's no amount of success or physical or um, any, anything that you create that you're always going to have to face those deep, deeper layers of yourself so um, how do you find that, um, what, are, what are some common traits that high level entrepreneurs, people that are very successful that you deal with, do you find there's a, there's a repeating pattern of um, yes. trauma or issues that those people are constantly facing? Yeah, I would say one of the most, um, not just um, the most successful people, but, you know, a lot of people I work with are very, very successful and well, very wealthy in their fields. Um, but one of the most pervasive false beliefs, traumas, if you will, um, energy blocks is I think most people just fundamentally don't feel good enough about themselves. They were told at an early age, you know, uh, that there's just, there's something wasn't, they weren't good enough for some reason. And so they spent the entire life, you know, and a lot of times, you know, all the early trauma happens between uh, when we're born and seven years old. And that's to be the age I find it most happens when people develop this, start to develop this notion that they're somehow not as good as other people. And they start to develop these egos to compare themselves to other people. Hey, they make more money, they have a bigger house, whatever. They're better at sports. And a lot of the most successful people I see, it's, you know, they're incredibly successful um, in the sense of the material world. They have, you know, the houses they want, the money, the jobs, the titles. But when you really get down to the reason they're, they're doing all this, it's because they have this feeling of just they don't feel good enough about themselves. Right. And so a lot of the work I do is, hey, you can have all these things in the material world, um, and you can still have the same passion for your business and stuff, but when it's not coming from a place of fear of, hey, if I don't succeed with this business adventure, then, um, you know, the underlying trauma is going to come back and say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not good. At good. But instead, you know, give people um, more of a growth mindset and to, you know, let go of the trauma of the fear of failure and not being good enough and to actually just start to have fun and joy in business mm -hmm. and start to see it as a game. You know, when we're children, I yeah. think children are just, they're there to play. And they do a good job at playing and winning, you know, but they don't have this ego attachment to it. Oh, uh, whatever, the ball went that way. I'm a terrible person, you know? Right. They don't have all this. 
but I, I really, the ball goes that way and they just go towards the ball without even thinking about a it. A lot right? of most so. successful, you know, adults nowadays, it's, you know, oh, I, I, I missed the meeting. Uh, shame on me, you know, and it's beating themselves up for it. Yeah. So I think it's a lot to, you know, start. The journey is a lot about self-love, self-compassion, how to um, how to do everything you're doing. But from that, that, night, that more centered, more joyful place within. Mm-hmm. When you do that, I think you actually get better financial results. And mm-hmm. people tend to pick up on your energy because you're not going to the meeting room saying, hey, this doesn't go well because I'm trying to protect my worth and I have all this pride to, to maintain. But when you let all that go, it's just, it's, it becomes almost effortless, I find. Yeah, yeah. I think that once you have the, the, the actual letting go of the ego, dissolving that me aspect, especially in business, when you really just connect to your heart and start thinking of everything as a collaborative value-based contribution, then people can really sense that. And overall, it actually does make all your results better. From my experience, the results just start happening naturally. And everybody that's not a part of that or isn't in alignment with that naturally just gravitates out of it, right? Yeah, I think um, so. What's really special is um, so on the 22nd, which is tomorrow, uh, the 22nd is significant, uh, significant day of the month because for me, it represents uh, an abundance portal. It's a day of the month where um, the energies are aligned, the vortex in such a way that our manifestations can be amplified. And so every, uh, every, every one of these days on the month, I hold an abundance ceremony for my friends and playa. And abundance is, I think, a really important concept. Um, and the way I describe it is it, it's a consciousness. So, you know, growing up, you know, it was more, um, it's the ego. It says, what can I take from myself? What can I, what, you know, what can I take? Um, how can I beat other people? But the idea of abundance is that, you know, everything in the physical that we want, um, whether it's good health, uh, love, um, physical things, money, there's enough of it for all of us. And so when we start to, you know, go less from the narcissism of the mind to the hearts, we start to tap into this real consciousness, which is more, I think accurately reflective of how reality is, is that you know, we live in a giant universe filled with abundance and there's enough for all of us. Um, but I completely changed the dynamic with business people who you know, they're out, oh, here's the customers, this is who you make money from, rather than people that are tapped into their purpose and are asking, well, how can I serve? How can I give back? And in my experience, I think the universe, God, source, however you want to describe the higher power, actually is more powerful than the ego trying to build wealth. And it's to look and see that the wealth is already within. Uh, I'm reading an incredible book now called uh, The Way of the Wizard. And it has a lot to do with alchemy. And, you know, a lot of people in the mid-century were concerned about how do you take baseline gold, lead, and turn it into uh, gold. That's what alchemy is. But true alchemy is taking a lot of the suffering, the pains, you know, we've developed. And how do you turn that into, you know, whether it's anger or pride, and how do you turn that into joy and gratitude and humility? Mm-hmm. And um, so a lot of the work I, you know, I help people with is to alchemize that. Mm-hmm. And they end up um, not just getting, you know, not just being happier for themselves, but through serving others in their hearts, actually attracting more abundance. But it's a state of consciousness that, um, you know, it takes some time to do the healing work to get to for most of us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what, what would you say, like, say somebody is a business person or they're becoming an entrepreneur and they are open to the, hearing about these concepts that you're speaking of, yeah. but there's, there's a part of them that just feels so disconnected and confused because it's such an overwhelming amount of information. And mm. quite frankly, it's very uncomfortable sometimes. When you really start doing the shadow work and the deeper work, you tend to just want to run away from it, especially if you haven't faced that aspect of yourself before. So what would you say is a good first step for somebody who, um, who who's going through their first spiritual awakening or going through that first phase of really knowing that yeah, hey, it's time to, to really take a step back and look within before I can keep moving forward. Yeah, um, you mean what kind of work they can do or like um, what they can expect on their journey or how do, you, how do you think about it? Yeah, I guess expect on the journey, yeah. Right, um, well, when I first started, uh, you know, I, I would say maybe like four years ago, I saw my, my first therapist and it was uh, eye-opening. You know, I said my whole life, uh, my father is a therapist um, and I, you know, growing up, I said, you know, I'm never going to be one of these, see one of these. And, you know, ironically enough, paradoxically, you know, it's kind of what I do nowadays, you know, for my, my work. Um, but it's this experience where, you know, at the beginning, you know, you're, you're given a mirror, you know, and at a certain level, you kind of start to see yourself as you really are. And it's kind of frightening because you say, shit, that's actually who I really am. 
ego might have an idea about who you think you are. Oh, I'm so good at sports. Oh, I'm so smart. And then, you know, you start to really, the shadow work, uh, to just go really brief in the shadow. The shadow is uh, the parts of ourself that we're not seeing accurately. And so, you know, when we start to start to look at ourselves in the mirror, it's, it can be overwhelming. Um, but I would say before you start the shadow work, what's really most important, um, and the mistake I see people in the healing journey make is that they go into it, the healing journey, with the same patterns that um, are used to keep them to be good enough. So they say, oh, I need healing. Oh, there, therefore I'm bad. Oh, there's another unhealed part of me. Therefore I'm bad. I'm not good enough. Mm. So I think it's important to step into self-compassion and self-love as much as you can before you start the shadow work. That way you're going into the work saying, okay, there's a part of myself that um, is, is not the way I want it to be but I can accept that, and from that place of acceptance, um, create change, rather than the opposite, which is if you go into judgment and you say, oh, this part of myself, I hate this, well then that part's never gonna wanna change, it's never gonna wanna let go, because mm -hmm. it feels it needs to be small and protect itself. So I'd say start with, um, as much as you can, just uh, learn, practice, do meditations, watch anything about self-love, self-compassion, and start there. Cool. Now, let's say somebody you know is going through abundance blocks and going back to the concept of money okay. um we i mean we the, the majority of people I, i'd say just really have a everybody has a relationship with money mm -hmm. right everybody has their own perspective about money and oftentimes it just comes from uh deep programming from childhood from uh from their friends from their family so on and so forth so what sort of what's the first step for somebody or not even the first step but what sort of things can you do practical steps that you can take to unprogram all of those beliefs that you have about abundance, about wealth, because there's, there's many people like on my entrepreneur journey that I've met, um, who are also interested in being a nomad, being, you know, working in, in these sort of countries, but they're just so attached to the idea of, well, if I go here, then I'm just going to run out of money and I have to go back. Or if I go here, well, how am I going to survive? And so pe people don't even take the first step because they're so afraid that if they take the risk, if they actually move towards the things that are connected with their heart and their purpose, that somehow everything's going to collapse. And by having that belief, what happens, it actually does collapse. So how do you start reprogramming yourself to be able to move towards that abundant state and make that your overall default? Yeah, uh, yeah, great question. I, um, well, I'd start by you know, learning, self inquiring with yourself about what are your actual abundance blocks. So we, we use this term and what we mean by it is a belief that you have that's limiting your ability to make money. Uh, so for example, people can you know, be, grow up and their parents tell them, hey, uh, rich people are evil. Um, they you know, don't, be, don't be like them, so therefore don't make money. Or uh, money is a sin, you should feel guilt or sin about it. Or people can believe, um, say, hey, uh, if I make money, that's actually taking money away from other people, rather than making a more abundant mindset, which is, um, you know, if I, I make a lot of money, actually I can use that money to uh, help other people, to you know, lift other people up. Mm -hmm. But I first have to lift myself up. So I'd say the first thing is to learn, uh, do self inquiry about what actual blocks do you have. Actually, um, one of uh, so my, one of my main businesses is the coaching, but Another friend and I, we're actually, we have a, a new technology product that's incredible. Mm -hmm. We call it quantum analysis. And um, what we can actually do is we can, we have a list of uh, about 50 questions that we have right now at different abundance blocks. And we can actually use the technology and it works through biofeedback. If, you've, if you're in this world, spirituality of healing, there's something called muscle testing. People ask questions about the quantum realm through, you know, using muscle testing, their fingers, sway test and we have technology that can actually uh, answer this for people, you know, and, uh, in seconds. And so we have a list of questions, you know, about 50 of them that are like this, you know, do you have a fear of success? Uh, do you have guilt around money? Um, whatever. And people can actually, you know, you know, maybe you could put a link up to actually see their, their abundance blocks live, you know, what actual blocks do they have? Um, other ways to do it, you know, talk to people, ask other people, uh, but just start evaluating yourself about, you know, if you're not where you want to be financially, for the, the answer for most people is no, they're not. And people want to be, to grow more in abundance, and that's fantastic, to want, to want more, to let their desires go. But to start doing the beginning of the shadow work to see, well, where, where am I um, internally not at? So 
uh, and then how is that reflecting in the physical? Mm-hmm. If, I, if I have a fear of you know, taking a, a chance and going to another country and starting a business, well, uh, it's the fear we need to examine, not so much the situation itself right. and work within, not so much in the physical. Yeah, yeah, 100% I agree. Yeah, I think, I think overall, like, just to believe that every single problem can be solved logically is, is just ignorant at the end of the day. To really understand that there's a spiritual solution to every single problem, every single mm-hmm. belief that you have about yourself that is stopping you from achieving what it is you want to achieve is worth examining just by looking within those energy blocks within yourself because your body and your overall intuition is always guiding you. And so when you when you really shift your attention from trying to solve within just looking towards gurus or looking towards answers in books, just simply letting go, that's a big word, letting go, and really allowing the flow to happen, you naturally tap into the sixth, sixth sense, which guides you into those answers that you're actually looking for. So um, actually, I want to I go back to the, te- the idea of the technology that you were speaking of. Um, okay. So Madison's been working on some uh, pretty cool technology he's been telling me about. He's developing some tools to be able to actually work through those energy blocks by using technology. Um, so I, th- I think it's interesting, you know, with, with the state of technology right now, mm. a lot of people are in uncertainty and some people think it's, it's literally the antichrist, the end of the world, yeah. um, so on and so forth. So how do you think we as people can use technology to our benefit while also being, not being attached and dependent on technology as much as we are right now? You take a look at people, they're scrolling through their phones nonstop every single day. Um, and so that puts you in this vortex of just being attached um, yeah. So much to comparison, so much to uh, the the overall approval of others, so on and so forth. So, how do you take a step back and actually see technology as a tool yeah. rather than than a destructive? Uh, That's a fantastic pattern. question. Uh, so, yeah, my background is actually I used to work in Silicon Valley and technology. I started my first tech company when I was 16 years old, and it's very successful. And you know, so computer science in school and so forth. And so, I spent a lot of time in technology, uh, but the last half of decade of my life has been away from technology, uh, more into spirituality and getting to know myself. And so now that I come back into the technology, it's a really interesting question. So where does it, how does it fit into this, you know, this humanism versus technology kind of debate? Uh, I fundamentally believe that, you know, I think, a, um, so I, yeah, I fundamentally believe that there's not a single thing that technology can't do that the human consciousness cannot. So I think a fantastic book on this, uh, Steve Jobs, you know, at his funeral, he passed around, um, Oh boy, what is the book's name? Um, an autobiography of a yogi, uh-huh. and the entire book, you know, it's incredibly powerful. I, you know, I the first time I read it, I had to put it down. It was, it was just so much. Uh, but the entire thing is that you know, in ancient India, they they had all these incredible technologies. You know, we right now we have Zoom to teleport, you know, to see one another, the World Wide Web to interconnect with one another. But consciousness, you know, at its at the higher states, is already able to do that. Mm-hmm. I think we are created, uh, you know, God, God created us in his image. So we have these incredible powers. But um, all that technology today, it's, I think, there to, we, we often give away our power. So I think chat GDP is a good reason, you know, another example where I actually don't think it's, a, it's fantastic. I think a lot of people give away their power. They say, oh, I need to write something or, you know, I, I need to do some creative thing. Can the computer do it for me? And then rather, you know, tap into their own consciousness, which is able to do these things, their own creativity, their own source of God, they give away the power. And they say, oh, no, the computer can do it. Um, so the way I think technology actually fits in to help people is it's actually to get people back to nature, weirdly enough. I think the technocratic system is largely based on ego. And it's, oh, we're humans. We can do better than nature. We can create things that are far beyond God. And I think it's egotistical. And I think the technology that's going to really help people is actually what gets them back closer towards who they are and themselves. And so in the technology I'm talking about, we call it quantum analysis, but it's all that information is, it's all something that you can access just by inquiring in yourself. But most people are so blocked or uncentered or don't know themselves enough that they, they aren't able to do that yet. So the technology is actually kind of a stepping stone to get them back to knowing themselves better. Mm-hmm. To knowing more about their health, their, their chakras are imbalanced, which trapped emotions or childhood traumas are they dealing with, which limiting beliefs they have. Um, so in my opinion, great technology is something that actually enchants the human capabilities and gets us back to our godlike state rather than 
takes away our power and our innovation and creativity, which I think is inherent within us. Hmm. That's very interesting. Um, so, yeah, I mean, with, with ChatGPT, for example, like, do you, do you believe that there's a level of misguidance we as humans can have? Like, when we, when we depend on a computer for answers, for example, and you're yes. not tapping into your, your sixth sense, your intuition, and really looking within for the answers, and you depend on just going through a chat, do you think you could be misguided with false answers or a false um, you know, perspective on what it is that the ultimate answer can be? I think uh, yes, and I think it's actually intentional. Uh, so like in a lot of these companies, though, they're, they have these very spiritual-based names, uh, Oracle. So you know, the, the biggest database company in the world, well, what's an Oracle in the spiritual sense? It's, uh, it's a seer, you know, someone who's, um, you go to, to see visions. And so Google is you know, the biggest Oracle, right? Rather than, you know, so you know, people, if it's, oh, what restaurant should we go to? You know, the, the first thing we could do is we could use our intuition, our hearts, we could allow serendipity, we could allow life and God to find the restaurant. But most people, they'd rather go to uh, whatever, Yelp or Google Maps to get the answer rather than, you know, allow life uh, to work its way out, to allow God to come in. And so, yeah, I think um, people, they put way too much of their, their, um, their, their seeking on the technology uh, rather than look within. It's, it's always within. All the answers, um, everything, even with the abundance. Mm -hmm. I think the kingdom is within. For me, it's, you know, with the abundance, getting back to there, it's, you know, there's so much emphasis on the physical and, hey, I'm going to work harder and work harder and work harder, rather than just complete the kingdom within and to feel whole and complete and then watch as the outside reflects the internal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, so I've been, I've been kind of doing some research recently on actually a lot of this technology that's being introduced right now from what it seems, from my dissecting, it seems like a lot of these things that seem like they're new were actually discovered thousands of years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And basically those societies were just shut down, tossed away, and put away to reintroduce technology in a way where it was, it's, it's a form of control essentially, is that right? Yeah, I mean, this, this stuff, obviously, like Albert and I, we love these topics and they can definitely get down a rabbit hole into ancient civilizations and uh, aliens and ETs and I think it's all there, but uh, yeah, you know, I think the narrative that we're falsely told is that uh, we have an iPhone now, and therefore um, this is the peak of technology. Um, and it, it's a, it, the ego loves this idea. It loves the, the, the modern ego loves to say, oh, we're not just uh, the most advanced people of our time, but of all of human history. The human ego would take it terribly to know that 2,000 years ago, people were actually far more advanced, not just within themselves, but with technology and that technology was actually an extension of human consciousness. Mm. The technology that I'm talking about now that I work with, it's not so much a, a computer that analyzes people, but it's an extension of the human consciousness which works. Um, so I think that what's funny is, you know, getting back to the autobiography of Yogi, the technology and the human consciousness and spirituality are one. Uh, and it's just finding out how to, to use that in the right way. Um, whereas, yeah, I think the technology now is probably, to be honest, something equivalent to... Um, you know, uh, wooden fire, and we think it's fantastic, you know? <laughs> like, I think it's the reality. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely interesting to think about. Um, so, what was my next question? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we live in this incredible place. Uh, you know, I don't want to go, this isn't my, my main sector, you know, of, of branch of knowledge, but yeah, we live in this incredible place in Yucatan with uh, Chichen Itza, you know, one of the seventh wonders of the world, this incredible pyramid. And, you know, uh, if you go to the tour there, you know, it's like, oh, there is these primitive, you know, old people that thought they could build a, a fancy primitive thing. And that, that was that, no purpose, you know, no utility. Rather than, you know, exploring how it connects to consciousness and how the seven steps of the Chichen Itza are correlated with, you know, levels of consciousness and, mm -hmm. you know, ascendance on the path. And uh, so I think, you know, as people are waking up, they're, they're starting to make all these connections mm -hmm. and they're starting to not quite believe the narrative and history as they were taught. Even history, right? Uh, his, his story. The, the stories, his they're, they're story, not quite yeah. believing the stories they were given. Yeah. And so, story is incredibly powerful. Um, yeah, and um, I think it's time we start to, uh, you know, not just within internally the shadow work, but the shadow work of society, what's true, what's not. Uh, but start by just by questioning uh, internally, externally, so making questions. Yeah. Yeah, and speaking of just actually being in a location and feeling the vibration and the, 
the level of consciousness change being in a location. So being in Mexico, there's a lot of underground waters, there's cenotes, and yes. uh, Madison and I have talked about how these cenotes in, in the past were actually portals to different realms. They're actually uh, a guiding force essentially for creating communities, creating and developing land, so on and so forth. So I wanted to ask you a little bit more about that. How much do you think the location, the overall place that you, you live in, the, the place that you travel actually affects your internal state of consciousness? Yeah, well, there's a, there's a fantastic uh, entire branch of spiritual study called astrocartography. And the entire idea is that, you know, that uh, so in the human body, we have uh, what are called meridians in the Chinese Indian medicine. So different lines that go to different energy centers. And the earth has the exact same thing. The earth has chakras, it has meridians, it has different grid systems. And so astrocartography is just really, I mean, I'd, I'd recommend it to anyone that's a digital nomad and wants to know, you know, where, uh, so I'll explain it first. It's, it's basically connects with astrology, stars, the planets, and the earth to see within your personal birth date, you know, your, your existence, where would be best be for you um, to, some people use it to figure out where to buy a house for real estate. Uh, what if, where to find love? Uh, what cities or places on earth are good for you for abundance or healing? Uh, so you can actually get these reports done and they're, you know, my mother actually had them done for me and they're incredibly powerful. I think they're pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, the, the actual energy environment that you're in plays a lot into things. Where we're at right now in Plata de Carmen is um, it's the place, the ancient place of the Mayans. And the Mayans were a really advanced people of healers actually. And a lot of the people like myself who work here, even, you know, Albert too, uh, have this tendency within us, this blood, to want to help people heal, to heal ourselves. And I think it's by no, no, no chance that we're, people are um, on this part of the path, are attracted here to, to do the healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like you naturally just gravitate towards it. Yeah. All right, so we'll wrap it up there. Um, if you want to visit Madison's work, if you want to learn more about what Madison is about, I will have all of his links in the description below he's doing some really cool projects and if you're in mexico or wherever you are in the world um, and you need some help or some guidance within your spiritual overall well-being um, i would definitely check out madison's instagram reach out to him if you have any questions on anything we've talked or discussed here today um, but aside from that is there anything else you want to promote or talk about no i appreciate it, albert this was an amazing discussion and yeah just my socials my instagram you can find me at um at madison.brucemann.com uh, at, at madison.brucemann and if you want to check out the technology I've been talking about um, you can type in yourquantumanalysis.com and um, read more about it there yeah and we'll have all the links to that in the description below but aside from that thank you for watching and if you're at this point of the video thank you for learning with us so um, I will see you all in the next podcast and we'll see you soon peace